just trying to think of who the uh, and we had Alan Nab uh, Kanabi yesterday talking about how f he was uh, highlighting how much he enjoys working with Curity on projects. So uh, it's good. You know, there's some been a bit of buzz about Curity already. Travis, great to see oh, you. Oh, great, Mark. Yeah, good to see you too. It's been a long time. Yeah, it's been too long. Okay, yeah. great. Good to have you here. And um, you're going to be talking about hypermedia APIs. I sure am, actually. I've been really looking forward to giving this talk. So uh, I'm going to talk about hypermedia applied to the problem of login. What fantastic. It's your um, uh, definitely your wheel, wheelhouse. You've sort of helped mature authentication and uh, login for and access management for APIs since everyone's moved to APIs, really. You know, so. Yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely been a long labor of love. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I'll leave you to it then. Cheers. Great. Thanks, Mark. So uh, as Mark said, my name is Travis Spencer. I'm the CEO of Curity. For those of you who don't know Curity, we are a peer play software vendor providing the most technically complete OAuth and OpenID Connect server on the market. And uh, I myself am a foremost expert in OAuth and OpenID Connect. I've been working with it exclusively since 2010. I've been working in the identity space since 2008. Um, I'm a software engineer in practice, computer scientist by training. Curity is also the company that runs and uh, is behind Nordic APIs, the API community uh, that uh, provides similar events to this um, and also has an online blog where we talk a bit about API security, but then bring the community together to talk about other aspects of APIs. And in this talk, I'm going to be talking about uh, hypermedia and how we can use this to provide secure, seamless user authentication. So in particular, I'm going to be looking at the need for uh, hypermedia authentication API. I'm going to talk about how it works uh, and juxtapose it against a typical solution, which will use a, a browser. Uh, talk about some of the, the shortcomings of that. I'm going to give you a demo of the hypermedia authentication API. And then we're going to talk about uh, client attestation, what that is, and how we can use it to contextualize the authentication to figure out if the application is published and provided by a first party or a third party. And I'll explain what I mean by those terms when I get to that point. So there are some different requirements that are driving a need for an API. Uh, in particular, we need to avoid customer drop ops during login. This ends up being very costly uh, for organizations who are providing digital services. We need to provide seamless login and authorization to mobile and web applications. And that means that the user experience needs to be controlled by the application developers. And we also need to reduce the frequency of login. No one's coming to your app to log in. It's a chore. It's a it's a speed bump, a barrier for what it is they really want to do. So we need to reduce the frequency, but also when they do need to do it, because it is required, uh, we need to reduce the, the friction uh, that's involved in, in authenticating. We also need a hypermedia API in order to comply with regulations. In open banking, for instance, if a bank is publishing a mobile application and that has seamless authentication, it's not OK for a third party uh, mobile application to use a system browser to do the login because that will introduce additional friction uh, and form an un unfair competitive advantage for the bank. So the same sort of integrated seamless authentication needs to be possible with that third party application as it is for the for the bank. Also on requirements, we need to control the branding and the look and feel of all the, the login views. and. We want to do this using the, the same technologies and techniques that are already being used. So we don't want to have to use HTML and CSS uh, rendered on the, the server side. Uh, instead, we want to use the same technologies that we're using to build the clients. So in the case of, of single page applications or web applications, that will very often be a JavaScript framework. And then in the case of mobile application, it will be widgets uh, that are native to the, the operating system. And of course, it's required that any hypermedia API be safe and private. So there's a number of challenges to meet these requirements when using the browser-based technique. Uh, that does introduce a lot of friction, like a lot of context switching uh, that can be challenging for many users and is not compliant with regulations that we just talked about. So this solution uh, really doesn't solve all of the requirements. And 
Also, browsers are on a death march to kill third-party cookies. So any sort of technique uh, where we're framing the login from a, a single page application, those will stop working in time. Also, all of the changes that have been made recently uh, to browsers with, with same site, um, having an additional flag of, of none, um, th those have caused challenges even for unframed login experiences and login solutions. So we need something that doesn't require cookies. Uh, and also one of the, the challenges for meeting the requirements is that a lot of people are, are building APIs that really aren't experts in security and, and experts at OAuth. And so they're sort of coming up with inferior solutions. And I've seen a lot of cases where people are trying to shoehorn multi-factor authentication into the resource owner password credential flow and, and other uh, kinds of uses of, of OAuth that uh, result in insecure solutions. So we need to come up with something that's that's safe for the end user. So Hypermedia is really a great solution for providing a login API because the, the REST architectural pattern lends itself to the problem of login. If you think of what login is, it's a, it's a state machine where you go from an unauthenticated state into an authenticated state and you transition uh, from, from point to point along the way. There's different, different states in that uh, automaton where you're, you're maybe entering different credentials or uh, different things like that. Uh, but it is a state machine and REST is really ideally suited for solving that problem. Uh, Hypermedia is also a great solution because one of the one of the, the challenges that we face is all these different authentication methods that come into play. And we need to have some sort of evolvable client that can cope with all these different kinds of credentials. So we need to be able to support things like using password, of course, but also a uh, federated login to Facebook and Google and SAML providers and OpenID Connect providers, but also things uh, like smart cards and integrated Windows authentication. And how do we solve all these different kinds of authentication mechanisms and two-factor and n-factor authentication without having to recode the mobile application all the time? That's really one of the, the big pushes for, for doing authentication in a browser. But we don't have to do that because if you think about what a browser is doing, is it's, it's calling already a hypermedia API. It's uh, every every part of the web is a hypermedia API. So we just need to provide the client with a um, better representation of the, the the state machine that represents login and to, to make sure that that API is safe and secure. So as a result, if we do this right with a hypermedia API, all of the existing clients will be unaffected. So let's look at how this, this works. And first of all, compare it to a solution where uh, a mobile application would use a browser. Um, it, it's slightly different when talking about a single page application because it will all be in the same uh, browser. But for this, we'll, we'll look first of all at the mobile application. So we have the mobile app here and it will call uh, the token endpoint of an OAuth authorization server to get tokens. And this is back channel communication, but before it, it can do this, it needs to authenticate the user and, and get authorization from the user. So this is very often done in a system browser and the communication will happen in what's often called front channel. And so this will communicate with an authentication service or a login website. And there the, the server will say what kind of login methods should be available and the, those will be all rendered in the browser and the, the user will log in. Uh, and then finally we'll have the the necessary credential or, or a code to call to the token service to get access tokens so it can start calling APIs on behalf of that user. So all of the views that are, are shown to the user are rendered server side and, and uh, shown to the client. I mean, they could be done client side also, um, but in any case, it's gonna be done in HTML. And in the case of mobile, it won't be native UI widgets, which is what we want. So what we wanna do then is we wanna remove the browser. We wanna have the, uh, the client make direct communication with the hypermedia API to do all of the authentication. So then all of those different authentication methods will be possible to do inside of that, that mobile client as long as it can understand the representations of the, the resources of the different login states in that state machine. So to look at it a little bit more in hypermedia-based approach, 
Uh, it always starts by calling a well-known URI. You'll see that in the demo. But you make that initial request, and you're going to get back some sort of authentication step. So this is going to be the first state in the state machine that, that the user traverses to get to the authenticated state. And in that state, there will be links and actions that will take the user to the next state. Those could be various things. Uh, the client doesn't need to know the order of things, just how to process those different links and how to uh, traverse the, the hypermedia response that it receives. In order to do that, it will get inputs from a user. Uh, those could be done automatically, perhaps, by the client, but very often the user will enter some sort of credential or uh, do some sort of action to prove their identity. And once that's done, uh, it could happen over and over again. So it could be many different responses. You could uh, reset your password. You could for, forget your email, forget your username. Uh, so it, it really depends on what the user does and what they, they enter. Uh, but by hook or by crook, at the end, uh, the user will be authenticated uh, or in an error state. But when they're authenticated, an authentication result will be returned to the client. And at that point, it will be able to uh, redeem that for uh, authorization or an, an access token uh, that it can use to call APIs. So in all of this, by using hypermedia, uh, we don't need to have a browser. OK, so let's look at a demo real quick, jump you over to this. Hopefully, you can see that OK. Um, so here, I have on the left side my client that's going to render different uh, different widgets. Uh, and then here, you're seeing the, the hypermedia response, at least the, the body part of it, not the HTTP headers. But this gives you an idea. So as I said, it starts by calling a uh, well-known URI. In this case, it's calling the OAuth authorization. Uh, endpoint and it's providing all of the the parameters defined by the uh, OAuth specification RFC 6749. Um, so so this this should be known to you. So I click on on start now and then the response that my client gets is an authentication step. So it's of type authentication step and then the the server is telling that this has a certain action. It has a template, which is a form, and in particular, a sort of subtype or kind, which is a redirect. And then it has um, a place where that redirect is, is going, which in this case is to the uh, authentication endpoint, and that the client should do a get on that. So I have a very um, rudimentary client, you could say, that I have to actually click this button to do that redirect. Typically, you could imagine a client that has sophistication to do that redirect automatically. Um, OK, next I do the get. And now I get another representation. So this is the next state in my state machine. And uh, in this case of this client that asks for authentication, there are three authentication options available to it. So it has to ask the user, which of these would you like to use? And those are returned to the client as another authentication step. This uh, has a, a template of selector, and in particular, a authenticator selector kind. And in that, there's different models, so a title. Uh, select authentication method, which my client has rendered here. And then I have different options, um, different links to Facebook of kind Facebook. So you could imagine a smarter client could put like a Facebook logo here, title that it puts here. Here, this one is to SMS. It says it's kind as of SMS. So again, it could maybe put a logo there, uh, different things like that. And then I have finally another uh, link uh, to a, HTML uh, form authenticator, and this has a title of username and password. So as a user, I could pick any of these, see how the states could diverge then, depending on what a user ends up picking. So I'm going to pick this one. The server then makes a request to that, gets back another set of links. Uh, it gets back uh, some information about a, a template. It has another the type, which is authentication step. Uh, here it has the actions. and in this, we have the field, which is the username and the password. Interestingly, though, at the top, we had some links here, which was uh, to a, a related resource for forgotten passwords. So here, my client puts the forgotten password button. Here, I have another one for forgotten account ID. Um, so I can recover my username and create account if I don't yet have it. So I could render all of these however I wanted. 
So you could imagine a mobile application being able to render this using native widgets. OK, so I'll log in. My user, John Doe. It knows that maybe it should be obscured because the type here was password. I'll go ahead and log in. And now the next state in the state machine is another of these redirects like you saw here. This is back to the authorized endpoint. Now the method isn't get, but it's post. It should post some uh, data using formula encoded. Uh, what it should post is a form field called token of type hidden with a value my client doesn't hide them, but shows them to me. But I can now click that. And now the result is uh, an OAuth authorization code, which then can be redeemed to the token endpoint to get uh, OAuth access tokens. So here it says that this response is an OAuth authorization response. Here's the code. Here's the original state. OK, so that's the hypermedia authentication API in action. We can look at it more at the end if you want to. Just ask questions if you have some. So this, in order to do this securely and safely, which is a very high requirement, it, it depends on attestation of the client. Attestation is kind of a weird word. It just means proof uh, or some sort of um, guarantee. And what we're trying to guarantee about the client is the identity. And so what we want to know is the, the Android package ID, and we want to know the hash of the signing certificate of that um, Android application. If we know those two things and can trust those values, then we know the publisher of the Android application. And we know which application in particular that publisher uh, has published. And in the case of iOS, we want to know the Apple ID, which is the concatenation of the Apple team ID and the, the application bundle ID. So again, this tells us the publisher and the specific app. And in the case of web, we want to know the origin. Uh, where is this thing running? From this, then, uh, we'll be able to determine how much we trust this application. And we can do this uh, in different ways on each of those uh, different execution environments. So on Android, we can use Android key attestation. And on uh, Apple devices, we can use iOS application attestation. And I won't have time to go into how we can do this on web, but we can do similar things there. So the way that the hypermedia authentication API works is that it's secured with an access token, like APIs typically are done. Uh, this access token, however, is not a bearer token. So usually when you use OAuth, you hear about um, uh, tokens, and those tokens are bearer tokens, meaning that anyone who has them can use them. So what we what, that's not what we want here. We want to have this token be bound to some particular client application, and to, if a uh, if the token goes missing or someone captures it or intercepts it, um, uh, we don't want that uh, that other entity to be able to use that as if it was the, the client application. So these are tied to a key. So you can sometimes hear these called uh, sender constrained tokens. But so we, we have this proof of possession uh, token, this, which we call this, this access token, the hypermedia API access token or happy access token. How do you get this? So the way that you always get tokens, you use OAuth. And so in this case, we will call it token endpoint. And we'll do depop again here so that uh, we want to keep these keys tied together. So this will also have a proof of the same private key. Uh, but in order to actually know who the client is and authenticate it, uh, we use the OAuth assertion grant type um, where the actual assertion is a client attestation token. And it will use the client credential flow, uh, so the grant type equals client credentials, and it will get back the happy access token. So then it will be able to use it when calling the API. So then the question becomes, how does it get the client attestation token? So sort of step one in this is to get one of those, those client attestation tokens or cats. So the way this works is the client application will call the attestation endpoint and it will ask for a, a challenge. And then it will take that challenge and it will feed it into the attestation mechanism on the particular platform where it's running. And then the, uh, the result of that will be uh, a challenge response. And that will be sent to the attestation endpoint. And uh, if it's valid, it will issue a client attestation token, a cat. And so then that cat will be able to be used when doing the, the client credential grant type. And then that will issue a happy access token. And then all of the hypermedia 
authentication API calls could be secured using that, that uh, happy token. So in all of these calls from the beginning, from the client at the station token to um, obtaining the happy access token to actually presenting the happy access token on all of the, the login API calls, we're using Depop. So you can't switch anywhere along the way uh, to some other client, okay? So let's look at this a little bit more and how the challenger response works on, on Android. We could do uh, look at it on web and iOS if we have more time, but in the case of, of Android at least, the challenge will be made to uh, the token server and it will get back some sort of uh, bytes and, and those bytes will be fed into uh, a hardware um, security module. And that hardware security module will make sure that um, the Android device's bootloader is, is locked, that it's not rooted, that it's, you, you can even set requirements that it's being done in hardware rather than software. And those bytes will be fed into that system. And then uh, it, you'll, you'll ask it to sign it with a certain private key. And then the response of that is an X509 certificate that includes the public key uh, that was used. And then also includes the, uh, um, hash of the signing certificate for the publisher of that application uh, and the, the package name. So in that X509 certificate, then we can use PKI to chain that up to, uh, in the case of Android, to Google's um, uh, root certificate. So then we know that, okay, this really was a safe execution environment. And uh, Google really is saying that the, the publisher of this app is so-and-so and that their package is this, and here's the public key. So then the, the public key can be uh, bound to this, this uh, client attestation token. And then on the next calls, when we're doing Depop, uh, this proof of possession, we wanna make sure that the same private key is being used at that point. And so when we get the client attestation token into there, we can see like, yes, this matches the, uh, um, one that was used to obtain the cat, and uh, um, this client is able to use the API, things like that. So then it will issue the happy access token, and then later on when calling the uh, happy access token like we just saw in the demo, it will all the time look at the, the proof of possession to make sure that it, it matches the one that, that, sh that was originally used. So you can't switch the key at any point. So this is how we do attestation. So attestation is really important because it binds a public key to the app identity and it also verifies the execution environment so that we can know that that uh, information about the application is trustworthy. So the private key remains all the time on the device in a hardware back system and all happy uh, API or all the hypermedia API interactions are secured by that. So the, the client application proves possession of that private key using the DPOP standard. So um, the, the obtainment of the um, attestation or the obtainment of the, the happy access token and the um, proof of possession are all based on, on existing standards. So is, once we- This is fantastic. It's got a real deep dive into uh, a hypermedia authentication and attest attestation is something that I'm sure is new for a lot of uh, viewers today. What can we're just running a little bit out of time, so I'm just wondering um, is there a final slide with your contact details, Travis? Yeah, there is. I need to make this final point though, Mark, otherwise it sort of undercuts the whole story here. And that is that attestation is very important because once we figure out the identity of the application, we can figure out if it's a first party or third party application. By that, I mean that the application is provided by the same organization that's providing the authorization server uh, or third party, meaning it's some other organization, some other publisher than the one running the authorization server. So in the case of the first party, I can, uh, you, 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 in that client application, you can um, 
accept credentials directly from the end user because it's the same as entering them directly into the authorization server. But if it's a third party, then you're going to want to do uh, some additional factor of authentication that the client application doesn't come in contact with. And you're going to want to do uh, signed consent where the signature is verified out of band. And in that case, the client, that third party client, will never be able to see all the credentials and assume the identity of the end user. That ties back to what you were saying about the um, browsers cutting off the availability for third-party um, uh, uh, authentication now. So this sort of, this sort of fixes all of that uh, chain up. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So typically with OAuth, you do a redirection back to a specific domain to prove that that the the client is in ownership of that domain but we can use attestation to achieve the same effect and in that way we can make direct calls from the mobile app or the web app to the authorization server and once we know if it's first party or third party then we use to use different credentials okay wonderful so here's all of the uh contacts to follow up with travis sorry to have to um uh, no, it's fine. a little bit 